Music connects us in body, mind, and spirit. It connects us within a culture through tradition. It connects us across cultures through its universality. This morning, a tenor and bass subset of the BUC Chalice Choir, sometimes known as No Treble, will explore these connections through a collection of a cappella folk songs from a wide range of cultures. Why folk tunes? Because folk tunes emerge from people and community. Folk tunes are not created by professionals with high-tech equipment and skilled producers to create commercial products. That's a relatively new development in humans making music. Before, about 100 years ago, if you wanted to hear music, you had to make it yourself. The songs you will hear and sing with us this morning are chosen with that in mind. This morning is about making music on our own because that is what humans do in community. Now, why a cappella? That's mostly because we all enjoy the beauty and the challenge of making music with just your voices. It is relatively easy and safe to sing behind a big piano, banging out the right notes at the right time. But combining only your own voices requires a coordination of body, a meeting of minds, and an openness of spirit that taken together is, for me, one of the mysteries of being human. We would like to share that experience with you, so if at any time this morning you are moved to sing along with us, clap your hands, stomp your foot, please, please feel free to do so. If you wanna just sit and let the music wash over you and through you, that's fine too. By the way, there will be an opportunity to stomp your foot. Our chalice lighting words this morning are by Marnie Singer. The chalice is the container 
the space where the musicians and the listeners gather. The oil is the fuel. The hours of practice and the life experiences of everyone in the room. The wick is the instrument and vocal cords through which the music will flow. And the flame, the flame is the music which is created as if by magic. When the instruments are lifted, the breath is inhaled and the downbeat is nodded. May this flame ignite the music within us all. The first song you heard this morning was called The Gift and was written by Russell Wallace, a member of the Little Watt Nation, the third largest First Nation in British Columbia. The song is not technically a folk song since it was not handed down through oral tradition, but it is based on traditional forms. The composer says, this song is about community coming together to prepare a feast, to celebrate the gift of traditions and transmission of knowledge. We chose that song as our call to worship with those words in mind. The composer further says, the lyrics in this song are not words in any language, but they are based on Aboriginal vocables from the Western part of North America. A vocable is a word or a sound that doesn't have any literal meaning. Um, you may be familiar with vocables like tra-la-la and shaboom shaboom. But because the words don't have literal meaning doesn't mean that the song, the gift, doesn't have a message. The first phrase in generally higher pitches is kind of left open-ended, like an invitation. <clears throat> then it's repeated, kind of insisting. And then the reply is in a lower register and it resolves to the first note of the scale. And it's kind of reassuring, it's kind of a welp welcoming. So it's repeated to reassure you that the welcome is true. This is a common question and answer form that you can find in music from all around the world. Even though the words in this song have no literal meaning, the song conveys that message. Now, like most of you, or I would hazard all of you, I'm not a member of this ancient culture from which this song comes. I can only scratch the surface of the nuance and the emotional content of a song like this has to people who grew up with it. But I find it inspiring and reassuring to hear in it the universal message of human community. Now it's time for all of us to sing. Um, our first hymn was chosen because it's the same question and answer melodic form that you, you, you heard in the gift. As you sing the literal words, think about how the melody is po posing an invitation and then giving the welcoming response. Please rise if you're willing and able and join with us in singing hymn number 395, Sing and Rejoice. We're going to sing this as a round. We'll do it once all the way through together. And then this half of the room will be group one. This side of the room will be group two and we'll sing it through twice as a round. Yeah, if you're following along in the hymnal and you're in group two, we will enter where the number three is. Sing and rejoice, sing and rejoice, let all things living now sing and rejoice, sing and rejoice, sing and rejoice, Let 
Morning. Good morning. In a moment, we will sing Wayfaring Stranger as our offertory music. The Wayfaring Stranger is one of America's most important American folk musics or folk songs. Its author is unknown and it originates from the mid 19th century. During the Civil War, the Wayfaring Stranger was known as the Libby, the Libby Prison Hymn. A Union soldier who was imprisoned in a Confederate Virginia prison inscribed the hymn with his dying breaths. I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger. I'm traveling through this world of woe. I know dark clouds will gather round me. I know my way is rough and steep. This song reminded me of my grandparents the first time I sang it. My great-great-grandfather was in the Civil War and spent time in the notorious Anderson Prison in, of, of Georgia. His grandson, my grandpa, lived a tough life. He was homeless at 15 and looked for lodging and work among friends and family. His work ethic and business acumen allowed him to buy two farms, raise a family, and play the piano in weekly gigs with his band. My father's father was also homeless as a teenager and spent years hitchhiking across the United States looking for friends and family and a place to belong. He taught me lessons of life that led me to Unitarian Universalism. My grandmothers grew up on farms in an age of workhorses, collecting eggs from chicken coops, milking cows and churning butter. They worked gardens and life-giving orchards to feed the family and prepare foods for the long winter months. My grandparents fell in love. <sighs> Made families, worked hard, and gave me life. I missed them. Golden fields lie just before me, where the redeemed shall ever sleep. I'm going over Jordan. I'm only going over home. I'm going there to meet my loved ones, to sing with them forevermore. Words from John O'Donohue, Anamkara, a book of Celtic wisdom. In the eternal world, all is one. In spiritual space, there is no distance. In eternal time, there is no segmentation into today, yesterday, or tomorrow. In eternal time, all is now. Time is presence. This is what eternal life means. It is a life where all that we seek, goodness, unity, beauty, truth, and love are no longer distant from us, but are now completely present with us. Khalil Gibran, you were born together and together you shall be forevermore. You shall be together when the white wings of death scatter your days. Aye, you shall be together even in the silent 
memory of God. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be free and welcome, is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way we live out this mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas. Environmental action, economic justice, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month. The plate share recipient this month is the Michigan Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence, which works on evidence-based policies and community education in collaboration with other states and at the national level. In 2018, BUC passed a resolution affirming the need for changes in law and society to improve on gun violence. Gun violence is in opposition to our eight principles and is an issue that has implications for racial justice, social stability, and the democratic process. The offering will now be received with gratitude.
We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation and dedicate ourselves to its service. Each week, members of our community share words of joy or sorrow with the congregation. If you would like to share a joy or sorrow in a future service, you can click on the Share Joys and Sorrows button on the VUC homepage, or you can arrive a bit early and write in the book at the bank of, of the sanctuary. And don't forget to write your name to indicate that we have permission to read it. Um, so we did have a joy shared by Jan Devereaux. Is it okay if I read it? Uh, Jan is grateful that this week uh, she will be joining her kids and five grandchildren for a fun-filled vacation. Um, I'm Tom Raffle. I have a joy. My mother is visiting for the weekend and she's out here to hear this. Among life's joys, we also share in each other's sorrows. Kimmery Campbell and Bill Fox share a sorrow. We were sad to learn of the death of Donna King after a long and determined battle against cancer. Donna and her former husband Kevin and their two children were active at BUC until a new job took them to Midland. Many people will remember Donna's warm friendliness and infectious laugh and the beautiful voice that she brought to our choir. Liz Cranston shares a concern. Please keep my parents in your thoughts as my father, Tom Cranston, recovers from emergency bypass surgery. His surgical team performed five total bypasses on Friday night and post-surgical pain has been a challenge, but we are relieved to hear that his long-term prognosis is looking good. Many of us have unspoken joys and sorrows and people whom we think of this morning. If you feel so moved, speak the names of those on your heart. Today's service is about music bringing people together in mind, body, and spirit. Even if you don't consider yourself a musician, I'm sure most of you have experienced a sense of connection when we sing hymns together. But what is it about singing together that makes us feel united in body and spirit? As a biologist, I'm curious about the evolutionary context to this question. From an evolutionary perspective, we can reframe the question as, why have human evol humans evolved this unique behavior of singing together in a group? After all, music making is rare in mammals. Believe it or not, we're the only primates known to be capable of mat matching rhythm or pitch. So singing in unison is fairly unique to our species, which means it must have been really important to our ancestors. Some scientists have proposed that early humans communicated with each other using rhythm prior to developing language, and that our love of music is a throwback to this ancient behavior. However, I think a bigger part of the answer is rooted in our deep-seated need to build community and to develop closer bonds with other people. A 2013 study published in Frontiers in Psychology found that unison singing quickly synced up singers' heartbeats. 
the effect was especially strong when they sang structured music that caused everyone to breathe in and out simultaneously. When we breathe in or out in unison, our hearts slow or speed up in unison. So singing in unison doesn't just bring us together in a figurative sense. As we sing, we literally breathe in rhythm with each other, with our hearts beating as one. Now, I invite you to join me in a guided meditation on breathing. At the end, please join me in singing Meditation on Breathing, number 1009 in the Teal Hymnal. Okay. Close your eyes. Find a comfortable position. Straighten your spine. Place your feet flat on the floor. Roll your shoulders slowly forward and slowly back. Relax your muscles. As your body settles, bring your awareness to your breathing. Notice the breath coming in and the breath going out. Follow the breath all the way in and follow the breath all the way out, not trying to change it in any way. Breathing in, I know I am breathing in. Breathing out, I know I am breathing out. Listen to the sound of your breath as it passes through your nose and head. Be completely absorbed in listening to the sound of your breath. Does your breath have a soft sound or a harsh sound? Focus on letting the sound of your breath be soft and full. Breathing in, I know I am breathing in. Breathing out, I know I am breathing out. Follow the path of your breath as it flows through your throat and into your lungs. Let your throat Feel relaxed and open. What does the breath feel like as it enters your lungs? Relax your chest and abdominal muscles to let the breath come in fully. Fill your lungs to the brim with breath. Breathing in, I relax my mind and body. Breathing out, I smile. Notice where your mind has gone. Is it still on your breath or did it wander? Acknowledge the thought and let it go. Bring your awareness back to your breath, back to the present moment. Keep breathing consciously and listening to your breath as your mind comes to a restful place. I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love when I breathe in. I breathe in peace 
When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. Swing Low Sweet Chariot is an African-American spiritual. Unlike many spirituals that arose before the Civil War, we know the author of this piece. Wallace Willis was born into slavery around 1820. His last name is most likely from his owner, Bruce Willis, a Choctaw Native American. <clears throat> Albeit a small minority of slave owners, there were several Native American tribes who held slaves. Based on oral tradition passed down in Wallace Willis's family, as well as from others who knew him after the Civil War, he started singing this around 1840 in the fields where he worked in Mississippi. This is one of several spirituals he composed, which also included Steal Away to Jesus. According to sources cited in Wikipedia, quote, Alexander Reed, a minister at the old Spencer Academy, a Choctaw boarding school, heard Willis singing these two songs and transcribed the words and melodies. He sent the music to the Jubilee Singers of Fisk University, a historically black university, in Nashville, Tennessee. The Jubilee Singers popularized the songs during a tour of the United States and Europe. The metaphor of crossing the River Jordan comes from the story of the Israelites entering the Promised Land after their escape from enslavement in Egypt. However, this piece does not refer to the initial crossing of the Jordan, but the glorious crossing that is described in the second book of Kings, where the prophet Elijah was taken to heaven by a fiery chariot came, carrying him over the river Jordan. In this song, as you've also heard in Wayfaring Stranger, the crossing of the Jordan represents the ultimate freedom found in death. But there may be an even another layer of the metaphor here, as in other spirituals, where the River Jordan is an analogy for the Ohio River, the last most important river crossing for enslaved people from the South to make it to the promised land of the North. As with many spirituals, Swing Low Sweet Chariot was often sung as a call and response. It allowed for a song leader to continue to layer more meaning into the song as they improvised new verses. Susan Thrift, who arranged the version of this song that we are about to sing, brings forth the call and response feeling for the verses that she has chosen for this particular adaptation. Remembering the history and meaning of this piece for its original composer and the many who sang it thereafter as they longed to be free, thinking of the layers of metaphor that come through in the words, what I most hope that you get from this piece is the emotional feel that the music brings to the continuing journey to freedom that we still have to fight for today.
The words to the next song we are going to sing are Czech. A very rough translation is in the first verse, ah, dear meadow, dear meadow, wide grass grows on it, tall grass grows on it. And the refrain, water flows from the mountains above, clean like me goes round and round around the sycamore. And the second verse is, there were two maidens, both fell in love, both cried bitterly. It is labeled as a Bohemian marching song, Bohemian, Bohemian because that was an older name of the region it comes from. But I think that marching song might be a misinterpretation by the arranger. It is more likely a children's song, something akin to Twinkle Twinkle Little Star that we all learned as kids. Like a lot of folk songs, this, this tells a very simple story. I'm sure there used to be more verses that explain the tears of the two maidens, but those verses are no longer in living memory. But the story this song tell, the, but the story this song tells is less important to me than the story of this song itself. To begin with, this song comes from comes to us from Eastern Europe sometime before the beginning of the 20th century. At that time, there was a sizable wave of Slavic immigrants coming from places like Bohemia, Poland, Croatia, Serbia, Ukraine, and Russia. These immigrants carried with them precious grafts of their culture and spliced them here onto this continent. This song was one of those precious seedlings. If you happen to be a Czech kid uh, growing up in a Czech neighborhood in a city like St. Louis or Milwaukee in the 1950s, this was still one of the songs you might have learned in school. Like this song, my grandparents came to the US as part of the wave of Slavic immigration. They came from Poland. I still remember a couple of Polish folk songs that my parents taught me, songs they learned from my grandparents who carried them to the US. It makes me a little sad to think that those songs will probably die with me and the rest of my generation. I Luczka Luczka survives today because of Marshall Bartholomew, the arranger. He was the director of the Yale Glee Club from 1921 to 1953 and was a prolific arranger of music for tenor bass ensembles. His arrangements were mostly of folk songs, spirituals, sea chanties, hymns. He was a serious musician who transformed the Yale Glee Club from what might have been called a drinking club with a singing problem <laughs> in 1921 to a premier musical ensemble that performed serious music in the most prestigious venues around the world. Yet, Marshall Bartholomew recognized the beauty and the power of simple folk songs. We sing now Marshall Bartholomew's arrangement of I Luchka Luchka with my apologies for singing Czech lyrics with a Polish accent. <laughs>
Our next selection, How Can I Keep From Singing, is an American folk song originally composed as a Christian hymn in 1868. Baptist minister Robert Lowry composed the tune and the lyrics are attributed to Pauline T. First published under the title, Always Rejoicing, it is based on Psalm 145, King David's sacred song of praise to God. In it, David promises always to praise God and to encourage others to do the same. He calls out God's graciousness, mercy, and compassion, as well as the glory of the everlasting kingdom of heaven. Scholars speculate that David sung this psalm often. Around 1950, Doris Plenn, who had learned the hymn from her grandmother, wrote a third verse about solidarity in the face of oppression. She shared that verse with Pete Seeger, who adapted it and reworded most of the Christian lyrics of the original. His version made the song popular in the 1960s. Irish singer Enya gave it new prominence in 1991, and in 1993 it was added to the UU hymnal. In our hymnal, the word God or Christ is replaced with love. That plus the original title, Always Rejoicing, and it absolutely delighted me to learn that that was the original title, sums up for me the connecting power of music. That no matter what we are singing, there is an element of rejoicing in the connection the song provides. And when I sing with no trouble, and with our choir, and with you, the resonance of other voices seems to add more joy to mine. This connection also explains why I can sing masses and other holy texts, even though I don't believe the words. They are written out of love, to celebrate, to rejoice, and my mind, body, and spirit unify and join with others to share the message. As we sing this arrangement of a familiar hymn, we invite you to notice the connections that arise for you, and we hope you rejoice. We, we just learned that these mics are no longer working.
We invite you to rise as you're willing and able and join in singing our final hymn, number 400 in the gray hymnal, Shalom Haverim. The translation is peace, my friends. Until we meet again, peace. We will sing this also as a round, once through all together, and then twice as a round, first group, second group, second group will enter on three. Shalom, 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 shalom